Hi, guys, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silenced them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 11, Logan Klein. In February of this year, police in Las Vegas responded to a domestic disturbance call involving a 37-year-old woman and her 31-year-old boyfriend, both of whom were homeless and living out of a pickup truck with the woman's teenage daughter and three dogs. The woman had extensive injuries, but she had an even more shocking story to tell authorities. What she told them led to the discovery over a thousand miles away in Texas of the woman's 11-year-old son, whose body had been hidden in the trunk of an abandoned car for over two months. This is the unbelievable, heartbreaking story of Logan Klein. My sources for today's episode were the Times Record News, Texoma's homepage, Facebook, the Las Vegas Journal Review, News Channel 6, 8 News Now, and Court Records and Documents. Before we get started, I hope you're all hanging in there. The global pandemic is affecting everyone in so many ways, and it's easy to forget we're not alone, especially when we feel so disconnected from everyone. Try not to let your depression take hold. Do things that make yourself happy. Most of my time is spent either researching and writing posts for the blog or the podcast, or hanging out with my kids, but I took an hour just for myself the other night just to watch the new Netflix special by one of my favorite stand-up comedians, Chris D'Elia, and I laughed so hard I literally exhausted myself. I didn't know until after I watched it just how much I needed to laugh. I guess all I'm trying to say is that amidst all the other stuff you're worried about right now, don't forget to take care of yourself. You matter too. This dumpster fire of a story begins with a 37-year-old woman named Stormy Johnson and her then 31-year-old boyfriend, Corey Trumbull. The couple was from Texas but had recently, along with Stormy's 15-year-old daughter and three dogs, been living out of their white 2020 Chevrolet Silverado four-door pickup truck in Las Vegas. At around 10 in the morning on February 26, 2020, An extremely banged-up Stormy ran into a business in a strip mall on Glen Avenue in Las Vegas, begging an employee to call for police and medical assistance. The caller told the dispatcher that the woman, who appeared to be battered, was scared and hiding from a male in a white truck bearing a California license plate, which was parked at the Walgreens across the street. The caller also relayed information from Stormy that, in addition to the man in the truck, was Stormy's 15-year-old daughter, who I'll call Elle. Police responded and made contact with the occupants of the truck, which was seen driving slowly through the parking lot of the business where Stormy was hiding. The driver provided his Texas ID card to the officer, identifying himself as Corey Trumbull and his passenger as Stormy's daughter, Elle. Three dogs were also present in the truck. Corey told the officer they were looking for his fiance, Stormy Johnson, who, he said, had gone into the Walgreens to get something to drink. He said he had fallen asleep, and when he awoke, Stormy was still gone. He said he tracked Stormy's phone to the strip mall's address, which is unbelievably creepy, all things considered, but that he couldn't pinpoint her without being connected to Wi-Fi. The officers interviewed all three people separately. Corey told an officer that he and Stormy had been dating for between seven months and a year. He denied any violence ever taking place between them. He said that Stormy had run off for about three days and that when she called him to pick her up on Sunday or Monday evening, he noticed she had black eyes and a busted lip. Elle confirmed separately that she and Corey had picked up her mom after she was gone for a couple of days, but she couldn't confirm what injuries her mom had. She said it was dark and her mom had been wearing a hat. She also said she had not seen her mom and Corey get into any physical confrontation. Stormy told investigators that she and Corey met in July of 2019 in Midland, Texas and had driven from Wichita Falls, Texas, to Las Vegas, arriving in early January of 2020. She said Corey became more and more violent as time progressed, telling the officer that she didn't feel safe either being around or leaving her boyfriend. Stormy said she had tried to escape him two days before, waiting until he was asleep on the afternoon of February 24th, before running from the truck to the 7-Eleven on Boulder Highway. She was upset and crying, but the employee working at the 7-Eleven called police and reported that Stormy was trespassing. What a dick! An officer who responded to that incident didn't see any injuries on Stormy, although it sounds like they weren't looking terribly hard. Stormy claimed that over the past few days, Corey had severely beaten her all over her body with a black and red stick or pipe, chained her by the neck to the truck's headrest with a metal dog leash to prevent her from running away again, strangled her repeatedly with a chain, 
and beat her entire body with his fists. Stormy was taken to Sunrise Hospital, where she was treated for a large number of injuries. The arrest report states, Stormy's injuries included a broken right shoulder, broken left elbow, broken nose, broken right middle finger, broken left pinky, broken right ankle, severe pain in her head, swollen and bruised eyes, and multiple swollen bumps on her face, swollen and bleeding upper and lower lips, swollen and severely bruised right thigh, swollen and bruised right elbow. At the time of the interview, she was scheduled to have multiple orthopedic surgeries to repair the broken bones. The radiologist noted that Stormy also had several other fractures that had healed. Holy shit. The officer noted in the report that Stormy was having difficulty answering questions, which might have something to do with the drug use she would tell them about. Corey, who also claimed that Stormy had been heavily using illicit drugs, was arrested and charged with a misdemeanor charge of domestic battery, first offense, as well as four felony charges, first-degree kidnapping, domestic battery with a deadly weapon resulting in significant bodily harm, domestic battery by strangulation, and coercion constituting domestic violence using threat or physical force. As horrible as that incident was, the domestic disturbance call also uncovered something much, much worse. While interviewing Stormy, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police received information that prompted them to place a call to police in Wichita Falls, Texas. That information led Wichita Falls Police Department investigators to the corner of Kenley Avenue and Borton Street in Wichita Falls, where police searched a room at the Red Roof Inn on Thursday, February 27th, before taping off the area with crime scene tape. A short distance away, inside a gray, older model Ford sedan that had been abandoned for over a year, police discovered human remains, just like Stormy Johnson told them they would. A witness at the scene told a reporter that the body could be related to the investigation of a missing child that took place in December at the nearby Red Roof Inn. Police believed the remains had been in the car since December. The body was later identified as that of Stormy's 11-year-old son, Logan Nicholas Klein. I learned about Logan's story through a Facebook group I belong to, where a fellow member posted a GoFundMe created by Logan's grandmother, Christine Bureau, to raise funds for Logan's funeral. The GoFundMe was taken down soon afterward at the request of Logan's father, Nicholas Klein, because the WFPD wanted to identify Logan's remains through dental records and complete official notification of his next of kin before publicly releasing his name. According to the person who posted the GoFundMe in the group, who's a close friend of Nick Klein, an autopsy was completed and Logan's cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma. Official autopsy results have yet to be released, even two months later, although more information did come out in an official indictment that I'll talk about in a little while. The Ford sedan was impounded. Two warrants for tampering with evidence were issued for Stormy Lorraine Johnson and Corey Trumbull. An additional warrant, this one for capital murder, was issued for Corey, who was already in custody as of February 26th. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department's criminal team Fugitive Task Force took Stormy into custody on February 29th. Many news sources initially stated that it was Stormy who was charged with capital murder. I reached out to the Wichita Falls Police Department, who confirmed via Facebook message that the capital murder warrant was indeed issued for Corey Trumbull, as stated by WFPD Sergeant Harold McClure in this Times Record News video clip. Our victim in that case is a 11-year-old white male, Logan Klein. Um, our detectives began investigating um, the case. Uh, initially, what had happened is... Um, we're working with connect, in connection with uh, an agency in Nevada, uh, in Las Vegas. Um, there was a family disturbance there. Subjects were uh, arrested uh, by an agency there uh, during their investigation. Um, re- we received information on a, uh, uh, a child, Logan. Uh, so we came to investigate that. Uh, it brought us to the 1200 block of Kenley. And during the course of that investigation is when we located uh, Logan uh, there inside the vehicle. Now, two warrants have been issued, uh, both for tampering with physical evidence. One was for, one, uh, was for a Corey Trumbull, uh, born in 88. Uh, the other is for Stormy Johnson, also born, or not born in 80, but born in 83, excuse me, but also for tampering with physical um, evidence. Uh, a capital murder warrant has also been issued for Corey Trumbull. Uh, Both subjects are in custody in Las Vegas, uh, so I am not sure if the warrants have been served. 
that may just be a matter of uh, just uh, uh, paperwork. Uh, however, uh, they are currently in custody. Uh, we know where they are, and those warrants have been issued and will be served shortly. Both suspects were detained in Nevada's Clark County Detention Center pending extradition to Texas. Las Vegas police have been assisting Texas authorities with the ongoing investigation. On a Facebook post made by the WFPD during the initial search, users made comments about rumors of a body being found in a vehicle. One user asked, were they shot or something? Another user, Christy Klein, responded, Christy is the current wife of Logan's father, Nick. In her comments, Christy revealed that her stepson was beaten by his mother's boyfriend and left to die in the abandoned car in December of 2019. She said that the boy's mother confessed what her boyfriend did and told the police where to find his body. Logan's father, Nicholas Walter Klein, is a first sergeant in the United States military who has served two tours in Iraq and is currently deployed in Afghanistan. He was able to return stateside in March to attend his son's funeral, which took place on March 21st. I'd like to give you a little background on the alleged perpetrators of this awful crime. We'll start with Corey Trumbull, who was born in Massachusetts in April of 1988, which means he recently spent his 32nd birthday in jail. I've been unable to find any information whatsoever on who his father is, but his mother was Elizabeth Betty Trumbull, who was one of 15 children born to William Sonny Trumbull and Geraldine Jerry Barber Trumbull. Sonny and Jerry were married in August of 1954 and spent most of their marriage living in Southwick, Massachusetts. Betty and her twin brother, Bobby, were the youngest of the Trumbull kids, born on September 16, 1972. Bobby suffered from cerebral palsy as well as Rye's syndrome, which is a rare childhood illness that can result from a viral infection like chickenpox or the flu, especially if the child is given aspirin. Rye's syndrome causes swelling of the liver and brain. Bobby died on November 18, 1984. Sonny and Jerry divorced shortly after Bobby's death. Tragically, Betty died on October 1, 1995, of injuries she sustained in an auto accident. Betty left behind five sons, Corey, Edwin, Alexander, Joel, and Tyler, as well as a daughter, Christina. Court records indicate that after Betty's death, her mother, Jerry, assumed guardianship of Corey. At least some of Corey's siblings were apparently cared for by some of their maternal aunts and uncles. Corey's grandmother, Jerry, died of cancer on September 18, 2004, survived at the time by five sons, eight daughters, 46 grandchildren, and 11 great-grandchildren. And I thought I had a big extended family. After Jerry died, Corey's aunt Harriet petitioned for his guardianship. She also raised at least one of his siblings. His sister, Christina, made a Facebook post a few years back calling Harriet her mama, but also acknowledged Betty's memory on the anniversary of her death, calling her my beautiful mother. Among Corey and his siblings, there are at least three, if not four, last names, so I'm not sure who their fathers are or if they were involved in raising their respective children after Betty died. One of Corey's brothers has listed his occupation as a street pharmacist, so there's that. Besides guardianship records, the only other court record I found in Massachusetts for Corey was a judgment from 2016 for a little over $800 that he apparently owed to a credit card. It's impossible to tell when or why Corey left Massachusetts for Texas, where he met Stormy last summer, but his last known address was a now-closed homeless shelter in San Antonio, Texas. Stormy Lorraine Holland was born on January 3, 1983, which happened to be her father's 20th birthday. Her parents, Orrin Preston Holland, who goes by Preston, and Dorothy June Savage Holland, were married in 1981 and divorced in 2010. Preston, who at one point owned a family-run trucking company, remarried in 2019. Stormy has at least one sibling, a brother, also named Preston. Stormy has lived in multiple cities in both Texas and New York State, some of which has to do with her military service. Stormy enlisted in the military pretty much right after high school, and she met her first husband, Logan's father, Nick Klein, in 2001 at Fort Drum, a military reserve in New York State. Nick and Stormy were married on May 17, 2004. While Nick served his first tour in Iraq, Stormy was pregnant with the couple's first child, after which she was medically discharged. She gave birth to Logan's older sister, Elle, in February of 2005 in Watertown, New York. Logan Nicholas Klein was born in Odessa, Texas in July of 2008, and in October of the same year, Nick and Stormy divorced. Stormy and the kids moved in with her mother, Dorothy, and both women worked for the family trucking business for a time. 
When her mother kicked her out, Stormy and the kids then stayed with her father. She lamented on Facebook about how much she hated working for her mother, so that career path was short-lived. Stormy was annoyed when her ex-husband Nick got engaged in February of 2010 with plans to marry when he returned from his second tour of Iraq in 2011, but she was dating too, seeing guys named Ben and Scooter before she met her second husband, Terry Johnson Jr., around March of 2010. When they married on October 9, 2010, Stormy was 27 and Terry was 40. Terry and Stormy had two kids together, a boy in November of 2011 and a girl in early 2014. It's not clear when the couple broke up, but it was definitely well before May of 2019 because that's when Terry remarried. After he and Stormy divorced, Terry took custody of their two children, who, thank God, are now living in a loving, stable home. I wish I could say the same about Stormy's other two kids. She had primary custody of Elle and Logan due to Nick's military service. She mentioned something on Facebook about Nick taking the kids for the full summer in 2011, and then every summer from 2013 forward. Nick remarried again in December of 2019 and has two other kids as well, a five-year-old son who lives with him and his wife Christy in Michigan, and a three-year-old son who lives in Arkansas with Nick's ex, Jamie, who also served in the military. There are a lot of stable homes and loving parents in this story, and for a while, Stormy really seemed like one of them. Around July of 2019, though, she met Corey Trumbull and everything went to shit. As you'll see when you look at the photo album I made for this case on the podcast's Facebook page, Logan was an absolutely adorable baby. Just listen to this clip of him at four months old trying to talk to his papa, Preston. <laughs> As a little boy, Logan was reportedly busy and adventurous. Stormy once recounted an anecdote about Logan falling back first into a window and ending up in the ER with glass in his back. When he was little, he was diagnosed with asthma, and he also suffered from pneumonia and multiple ear infections. Logan was a little sidekick to his older sister, Elle. The two seemed to have a close relationship. Elle posted a lot of photos and videos of herself and Logan goofing around together, laughing and making silly faces. Some of her captions included, He don't know it, but I love him to death. Love you, Bubba. Me and the little dude had a good day with him. I love him even though he's annoying at times, but every single day I don't show it, but I love a little more. I hope the bond I have with him doesn't break. She also posted a lot of cute and silly pictures of herself and her mom, where she and Stormy went back and forth in the comments proclaiming their love for each other. Stormy and the kids seemed to move around quite a bit, but by the fall of 2019 they were evidently homeless, living out of hotels, and Stormy had all but cut her entire family out of her life. Carrie Pulaski, who taught Logan for just a month while he attended school in Chillicothe, Texas, knew something was wrong with his home life, but it was clear the adults in charge at home knew how to avoid suspicion. Um, he wasn't there for long, but he was very quiet. Um, he was a sweet kid. You could tell he wanted to try to make friends, um, but we knew something was wrong, that things weren't necessarily right for him. We contacted um, CPS four different times, our school did, um, but by the time they could get anything done, they had already moved on. You could tell they knew what they were doing by moving. At some point, the family ended up in Wichita Falls, Texas. On November 25th, Stormy posted an ad on the Wichita Falls trading post that read, I'm a single mom who's estranged from my family and two of my kids, but I do have two others. This post is hard for me, but I thought I'd bite my tongue and ask for help so my kids and fur babies stay off the streets. We have overstayed the hotel shtick, and just before moving my minivan crapped out. It's hard for me to ask for assistance, but until I can get certain things in place, I cannot work because my son is MHMR. Any little will help, and we know where we want to live, but it'll take some cash I don't have. Stormy's claim that her son was MHMR indicates that Logan had some degree of special needs, although I found no evidence that he was ever diagnosed with anything of the sort, and Stormy's own mother seemed to refute that claim in a Facebook post I'll touch on in a minute. Logan's former stepmom, Jamie, said in a Facebook post about Logan, God help me control my anger. All this boy needed was a little love. On December 1, 2019, Stormy made a post on a different Wichita Falls trading post page reading, Tomorrow we move into our apartment after living in a hotel for a few months. My best friend moved me out of a nasty situation and we left what little we had behind. If y'all have anything you want to donate, we would appreciate it. 
We have a three-bedroom apartment to put stuff in. We also need essentials for the house. Tomorrow, we may need to borrow a truck to move a few things. In the process of us coming out here, my van broke down in Vernon. Also, any help with groceries is appreciated. We would go to food bank, but don't have a vehicle, and we're starting completely over. Many thanks for the thoughts and prayers. They are very much appreciated. That was right around the time investigators now allege that Corey Trumbull murdered Logan, who was 11 at the time of his death. On December 9th, Stormy's mom, Dorothy, made that public Facebook post I mentioned a few minutes ago, which said, I would like to let everyone know that if Stormy contacts anyone, please know that she is able to work. We did not exile her from the family, and Logan is not like she says. He is healthy as far as we know. She has blocked me, Preston, and his wife. We have tried to help her any way we can, but she wants nothing to do with us since she has a new boyfriend. In the comments below the post, one person asked if Stormy was on drugs, and Dorothy responded that she wasn't sure, but that Stormy had lost a lot of weight, and that the situation broke her heart for her grandkids. Some commenters said Stormy had blocked them from contacting her as well. One person asked if Dorothy thought the new boyfriend, who, for the record, was Corey Trumbull, was part of the problem, and Dorothy responded that the new boyfriend was all of the problem and that neither of them worked. One family member said she was worried about Stormy's kids, and Dorothy responded, That is our biggest concern. Dorothy commented, I do know where she is, in Wichita Falls, calling everyone for money. Have called for wellness check to no avail. I strongly suggest not to give her money. She keeps trying everyone. A relative replied that Stormy had just sent him a message on Facebook Messenger, to which Dorothy said, I am so sorry and embarrassed. Another responded to that, Don't be, it's not your fault. I served with her in the army. Something isn't right. This just doesn't seem like her. Something is off. The family member who had just received Stormy's message added, It's not your fault or your problem. She makes her own choices. You raised her well. Just sometimes they fall off the path and have to find her way back. What's really sad is that before that post, all of Dorothy's previous posts mentioning Stormy have been about how much she loves her daughter. It really seems like the problem started when Corey and drugs came into the picture. We now know that by mid-December, Logan was most likely dead his body stashed in the trunk of an abandoned Ford sedan near the Red Roof Inn in Wichita Falls. Charging documents accuse Corey of hitting Logan in the head and or body with either his hands or a blunt instrument, causing Logan's death on or about December 1, 2019. As I said earlier, the official autopsy has not been released, but the information I've received indicates the family was told Logan's cause of death was blunt force trauma. Now strap in, you guys. You might have thought this story was dark already, but we're heading into some even darker territory. On March 23, 2020, Corey Trumbull and Stormy Johnson received additional felony charges relating to their conduct in Las Vegas, and this information is completely gut-wrenching. As it progresses, this case just keeps getting worse and worse, and I honestly didn't think that was possible. Prepare to feel immediate, visceral rage when you hear this. The new charges against both Corey and Stormy include one count of visual pornography of a person under 16, three counts of sexual assault against a child under 16, two counts of lewd acts committed by a person over 18 with a child of 14 or 15, one count of child abuse or neglect. Corey faces one additional charge of statutory seduction by a person aged 21 or older. The details behind these charges will make your blood boil. Las Vegas Metropolitan Police investigators say that while in Nevada, Corey begged for money on the Las Vegas Strip, Stormy did a fuck ton of illicit drugs, including and especially meth, and they, along with Stormy's 15-year-old daughter and three dogs, drifted from motel to motel, living out of their truck in between. One allegation against Corey is that he committed statutory rape at a hotel in the 3700 block of Las Vegas Boulevard on January 22nd. On March 4th, an unnamed, underage, alleged sexual assault victim was forensically interviewed at the Southern Nevada Children's Assessment Center. The interview was observed by a detective. The girl told the interviewer that a lot had happened since she was last interviewed right after her mother's arrest, but said she tried to forget about a lot of it. The girl told the interviewer that she met with a foster family, but she did not feel comfortable with them and opted not to live with them because she doesn't like to live with men she isn't related to. She said things that happened in her past changed the way she sees men, such as waking up screaming while being inappropriately touched when, as a very young child, she lived in a double-wide trailer with her mother and other people. The girl told the interviewer that she regretted telling anyone certain things and that she has moved on from the experiences. 
A week later, court documents state that a CPS investigator met with a woman, obviously Stormy, to take a recorded statement. Stormy told the investigator that her drug use was real heavy. Corey, she said, told her he wanted a polyamorous relationship and that she had no say in the matter. She also said Corey told her the white race is supreme and should multiply. This guy sounds like a winner. She told the investigator that Corey and the underage victim began a sexual relationship behind her back, but she had to pretend she was fine with it because she was both afraid of and in love with Corey. Tiny soapbox moment. A grown man with a 14 or 15-year-old child is not a relationship. It's straight-up rape. Anyway, Stormy said she actually witnessed Corey having sex with the victim, but she could not intervene due to her fear of him. She said that once Corey began his quote-unquote sexual relationship with the girl, she became an outcast who was just there, so she just did more drugs, dealing with Corey raping the girl by getting more high. Sounds like a plan, super mom. Next, Corey consented to a recorded interview with a detective, during which he was read his Miranda rights. He told the detective he met Stormy online before dating her for 8 to 12 months, and that they had a good relationship. He began to cry when he admitted to the detective that he had sex with the girl but didn't remember the first time. He told the detective that he and the woman had multiple threesomes with the underage victim, but he denied giving the woman methamphetamine. Sorry, but at this point, giving his girlfriend meth would have been far from the worst thing this slime bag did on any given day. <clears throat> Allegedly. A DNA swab was taken from Corey's mouth at the time of the interview. After Corey's interview, Stormy was interviewed on tape again, this time by two LVMPD detectives who read Stormy her Miranda rights. She told them that Corey first posed the idea of having sex with a teenage victim as a joke. While the two of them smoked in the bathroom, Corey told her that back in the Middle Ages, the victim's age would be like womanhood. Pardon me while I go throw up for a second. The woman said that she told Corey no, but he replied that if he wanted it, he would take it no matter what. She laughed it off because, sure, that's an appropriate reaction to your grown-ass boyfriend threatening to rape your teenage daughter. Corey later told Stormy that he and the victim had been together several times and that she should mind her own business. She didn't, however, remember if she had actually participated in the threesomes Corey claimed had happened, saying that because of her meth use, her brain wasn't what it used to be. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. Stormy told the detectives that she was mad at herself for not doing anything. Welcome to the club, lady. The detectives told her that she had opportunities to intervene or report Corey's crimes. At that point, she asked for an attorney, and detectives ended the interview. Another interview of the young victim was conducted on March 12th by a CPS investigator. The girl said she had caught feelings for Corey and had fallen for him, saying they would quote-unquote do the dirty while they were in a relationship that she said had since ended. She referred to Corey as her best friend, who she said was there for her. How unbearably sad is that? The way this alleged domestic abuser and child molester terrorized, manipulated, and groomed this beautiful little girl fills me with absolutely blind, burning rage. Her most recent Facebook cover image, posted after her mother and Corey were arrested, is a collage featuring photos of herself with Stormy and with Logan, as well as a photo of Corey. If that's not Stockholm Syndrome, I don't know what is. According to police, a search warrant served on Corey's truck turned up a camera that contained images of Corey participating in sex acts, as well as nude photos of two females, which Corey claimed someone else took. Because of all the things he's accused of, taking naked photos is the one he won't admit to? Now, this is just my opinion, but I'd be willing to bet Corey's disgusting, deviant desires have everything to do with Logan's murder. My guess is that Corey thought of Logan as an obstacle to his ability to pull off his dream lifestyle and that's why this poor kid ended up dead in an abandoned car. Elle is now living with her grandparents, who are helping her start to heal from the traumatic events she's experienced in the past year. As her grandmother said, her journey is just beginning. I wish all the strength, peace, and happiness in the world to that little girl, who deserves all that and more after everything she's been through, especially losing her little brother. Corey was indicted by a Wichita County, Texas grand jury on April 15th on a charge of capital murder of a person who was at least 10 but younger than 15. The grand jury set Corey's bond at $2 million. He and Stormy have not yet been indicted on their charge in Texas of tampering with evidence or in any of their Nevada charges. They are both still incarcerated in the Clark County Detention Center in Nevada. As I wrap up this soul-destroying story, I just have to say that my heart goes out to the Klein and Holland families. 
They all seem like genuinely good people who shouldn't be dealing with any of this right now. Nick Klein in particular, a legitimate American hero who actually saved a man's life on his wedding day in December, did absolutely nothing to deserve the loss of his son and everything that has happened to his daughter. All he did was defend our country and put his trust in a woman he had every reason to believe would protect his children. Logan's heartbreaking story is ongoing. I'll continue to provide updates on SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com as they happen. In the meantime, let's remember Logan as he was in life, a sweet, funny 11-year-old boy who loved goofing off with his big sister and making the most adorably silly faces and photos. At least he's at peace now, free from the fear and uncertainty his mother brought into the last year or so of his life. Rest in peace, Logan. That's it for today. Join me next week for another case. If you haven't yet, please give me a like on Facebook at Suffer the Little Children Podcast and Suffer the Little Children Blog for more stories like Logan's. Stay safe out there, guys. Please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes, leave a voicemail, and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive show merch. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter at STLCPod. I've posted a photo album for today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also read about today's case as well as many others at sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com. This podcast was written and produced by Lane. Music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from audiojungle.com. Always remember, hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys.